actually, I Go ahead. got it. Okay, superb. Uh, okay, so okay, let me talk for a few minutes and then I'll share my screen. Um, okay, everyone. So I'm Johnny Farage, and um, I, uh, you know, I started off as a listener when I was young, and then I became a musician, but. Um, Funnily enough, when I grew up in Lebanon, my ambition was not Arabic music. It was more like progressive rock. So I went through my progressive rock phase. And then uh, as I got a little bit older, I started listening to lots of jazz. And then I was really in love with jazz. I had this, you know, vague, wild dream of becoming a jazz pianist. I was a kind of a decent uh, pop music pianist, <laughs> uh, all that, all that good stuff. And then I left Lebanon and then I started, you know, I reversed the cycle. I started wanting to really learn more about Arabic music. And I started, uh, I mean, I had been listening to it, but not like professionally and not, uh, I listened to stuff that was on the radio, but not the heavy duty stuff, the stuff that collectors listen to, you know. Uh, and that means going back in time, you know, instead of listening to 70s and 60s music, I started listening to 1930s music. Lots of instrumental stuff, started listening uh, a lot to Oud, um, Oud CDs, uh, and then um, in New York I started taking Oud lessons, and then kind of everything kind of started culminating together into this um, website that I did. Uh, and, you know, from the website I was still interested in documenting the tradition in a wider format, and then I started working on the book. It's maybe 10 years ago now, and then it was published three years ago. So basically, I really enjoy the listening to the music. I enjoy performing it, and I enjoy talking about it. I enjoy teaching it. Um, I give uh, lots of uh, lessons on the rick, which is my instrument. I'm going to show you a rick. I have a few here on the wall behind me. This is a rick. It's a tambourine, basically from Egypt and Syria and Lebanon. Um, and I'm taking, uh, I'm, I'm studying the oud right now. This is my oud. Uh, my level is about a two year old, two years, two years old student on the oud, so I can do some decent playing, but I can't really play in a in a gig. Uh, so all of the gigs that I play are on the rick, and so that gives me the opportunity to be out there with other musicians. And you know. I don't know if you guys discussed uh, the oral tradition and oral learning. Uh, I do most of my learning from people orally. Uh, I do read books from time to time, but that's not how I learned the music that I know. Okay, so so Uncle Tum. Why Uncle Tum? Because <laughs> I, was, I was watching the, the Avengers movie with my 11-year-old son, and there was a line I'm going to quote from there where Thanos says, because I'm inevitable. And, and Uncle Tum is inevitable. Uncle Tum, you can't really not think or not <laughs> not listen to or not consider Uncle Tum. She is like the, the, you know, the mountain in the middle of all the, you know, other tiny musicians around her. She is like the giant of Arabic music. And she dominated, I'm going to share my screen and show you some, some pictures of hers if you haven't seen them. <clears throat> um, all right, so this is uh, Uncle Thum. I'm going to show you lots of videos of Uncle Thum, but she was the, you know, the most prominent uh, Arabic, pan-Arabic music singer uh, of the 20th century. And her career lasted a good, th uh, a good 55 years, something like from like around 1930 to around 1975. Uh, no, that's, is that 45? Okay, maybe the late 20s to the mid, okay, around just under 50 years. Okay, so that's, it's a pretty impressive career and she basically managed to move with the times and uh, work with different composers and stay on the forefront uh, of all the, uh, you know, media that was available at the time. So she started with um, records, uh, very old records. I think they were 33 RPM. Uh, or maybe before that, there was a, another format before that. Um, and then she dominated the radio when the radio came on. The only medium that she did not dominate while other singers dominated were was movies. She did two movies, decided it wasn't her thing because she was like really confined musically in a movie and she didn't like that because in a movie, the songs had to be, you know, simpler and shorter and she didn't have you know, the opportunity to, we're going to talk about how she sings and what she does, what's so amazing about her. 
Uh, and finally, uh, the, the cassette market was very, very big in Egypt. Everybody and their mother has Um Kulthum cassettes. And then the live music scene, she was doing live concerts for, you know, most of her career. Uh, the most important uh, event every month was the uh, third Thursday of every month. She gave a public performance in Cairo and that was attended by, you know, uh, a very important people like this is one of her performances uh including like in this uh video you're gonna see that the president of egypt abdel nasser at the time was in attendance okay so uh she hobnobbed with the uh, presidents and kings and uh you know very rich people even though her background was very very poor and modest she came from a village you know an agricultural uh background but she kind of I mean, by, by all accounts, she's a uh, feminist success story. And, uh, you know, a lot of the coverage of Uncle Thum in America, at least, uh, recognizes that, you know, she took her career to the max in a, in a world dominated by men. Uh, and it's still like the instrumental world of Arabic music is more or less still dominated by men. The singing world is not. I mean, you can have, you know, as many female singers as male and more. But the instrumental world is still more or less even things have shifted a little bit, but not not it's not to, uh, at 50 50 yet. Anyway, so uh, a few things about Uncle Thum. This is a very good book. Oh, is my image in reverse um, mirror image? OK, I'm going to read. It says The Voice of Egypt by Professor Virginia Danielson, uh, who used to be at Harvard. Uh, now she's uh, I think of sure she's in uh, Abu Dhabi or something. Uh, yeah. Not sure where she is, but you know, at the time she was, you know, in Harvard. Uh, she wrote this amazing book, and the book was also turned into a documentary. There are many documentaries on Uncle Tum, um, and one of the uh, media about Uncle Tum was a um, a dramatization of her life. It was a TV series in Arabic that I really, really, really enjoyed watching. Uh, maybe like 15 years ago it came out or something like that, or maybe more. Uh, I watched it uh, avidly. It was amazing. It was like a historical documentary, but kind of dramatized a little bit. And so, um, so what was what was Uncle Tum's environment, and why is she so so you know so powerful and ubiquitous? Um, you know, she she grew up. She basically rode the, the, the wave of the Arabic music, uh, you know, um, golden age, if you want, all the way to the top. So she started at the beginning of the golden age and she managed to like stay on top of that wave for like 50 years, all the way to like 1970 something when she, when she died. And by, by my account and many other accounts, the, this was kind of the, the, the top of the wave. And from that point, it started going down in terms of quality and uh, quality of composition, quality of, uh, you know, playing, quality of improvisation, quality of listeners. The listeners basically kind of got dumbed down a little bit and they didn't require something very elaborate and sophisticated and rich like Uncle Toons. Uh, OK, so. Um, go to go to uh we go to my website a little bit uh i just want to talk about forms because um it's interesting you kind of you kind of situate a a singer or a musician by what kind of forms they they work on the most right and in the vocal composed forms uh she worked on the daur form the plural is adwar uh, but she skipped those two which are very popular in aleppo so she was like firmly in the egyptian tradition uh, she skipped the Moshrah and the Qad and, and Ta'tu'a is basically a simple song with a repeating refrain. She did lots of those. Uh, Ogniya just means song in Arabic, but really uh, figuratively it means a long song, like a song with different uh, sections, big sections and modulations. And uh, that, that kind of a song can be from 20 minutes to 50 minutes. Um, and also the same uh, composition uh, song can be performed in different ways with different repetitions with different improvised sections and can the same song can be performed in different concerts like if you go to youtube also from like uh, 30 minutes to 60 minutes whatever it depends on the uh, recording uh, I'll, I'll i'll come to that in a minute okay uh qasida is a it, it means a metered poem in arabic uh, and and the lyrics are in classical arabic or 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 modern standard arabic but some of them are like very old arabic 
uh, monologue is a monologue and a duet. She, I don't think she's done any duets, but she's definitely done monologues. Lots of qasaid, ugnia, ta'tu'a, daur. So she did most of those forms except the ones that were really popular in Aleppo. She didn't do those much. Um, okay, and so that kind of is part of her uh, appeal and part of her clout and part of her fame. Um, now, the other thing you you need to like um, learn about when you learn about Umm Kulthum is she worked with many composers. Uh, she never composed her own music. I don't think, I can't remember her composing anything really. She wasn't a composer, but she worked with many composers. Uh, basically, the biggest and greatest composers in Egypt were like knocking on her door, waiting in line to compose to her. Um, there was like a one one short period in her life where she wasn't well known and then the, you know right after that after she released her first uh, recording or a couple of recordings then she basically people figured out okay this is the one and then they started basically doing their utmost in order to um to compose for her so if you were an uncle tomb composer that was like a the seal of quality on your cv you were kind of set for life you composed a song that uncle tomb sang and she was very 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 selective uh, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop talking for a while because it gets boring, and we we'll listen to a sample of her songs, uh, and then we'll go back and talk some more. Is that okay, Justin? Okay, I'm gonna start with an old one. Uh, this is from. Actually, I'm gonna look it up in the index. I'm gonna talk about this index in a second. This is also by Professor Danielson. Uh, I'm going to try to tell you what year it's from. Uh, okay. So this is a very, very handy document. If you do filters, you can go to, to jar and do Daur. And then uh, Min al -Lial. This is what I'm looking for. It was in 1936 by Zakaria Ahmed. Zakaria Ahmed is one of the, you know, one of the top six composers of Uncle Thum. Um, Okay, let's listen to one of her songs. So this is a daur. It was uh, basically recorded over 6.43, uh, 6 minutes 43 seconds because it had to fit on a record. Uh, I mean, like Um Kultum, you know, has tremendous vocal energy. She, like to, to confine her in 6 minutes and 43 seconds is, is like a crime, right? But she did that for the sake of selling records. So is my audio coming? I turn on a little bit, Johnny. That was the introduction of the daur. It's usually like half a minute or less. It's a very simple motif, and then the daur will start. So let's let's hear it again. What's the point of the introduction? <clears throat> to warm up the musicians, to warm up the singer, <clears throat> and to introduce the maqam scale. Because you know, the maqam. Uh, I don't know if some of you were present at my other lecture about maqam, or you've read something about it. But basically, the maqam is the modal system. It's the mode with within which we compose a song. Uh, and it has many possibilities, but basically it's firmly, uh, you know, uh, firmly uh, attached or, you know, <clears throat> related to a scale. Uh, but from that scale, you diverge and divert and make lots of changes. But this is the maqam scale that's going to be introduced by this very short dulab. And it's maqam rust, which is like the most famous and ubiquitous maqam. Okay, so if I was sitting on the uh, the jury of uh, America's Got Talents, you know, uh, by that time, I I have like made several observations and conclusions about Um Kulthum's singing, right? <clears throat> um, I I tell you, I, I, like if I was if I was at a concert today and uh, there was a brand new singer that I never met before and she sang this this much only, 
I would be very, very, very impressed already because of so many things. First of all, her range is beautiful. She sang an octave and she's gonna go above an octave. We know that from the composition. So her range, very, very comfortable on the uh, on the lower uh, tonic of the of the scale. Oh, da, 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 da. And she's gonna go way beyond that. Ah, da, da, da. She's gonna go a fourth or a fifth degree above that. So that's an octave and a half where she's very, very comfortable. Uh, the quality of her voice is very very beautiful that's subjective but i don't think anyone uh, in the arab world disagrees uh, about her the beauty of her voice or they probably will get hit by thunder and lightning uh, and the um, her diction is excellent and her intonation so how closely she can do the the scale um, so intonation in arabic is not a simple matter because uh, it's microtonal you know there's so many details uh, that uh, are very very close together that have to be rendered correctly in order to get the correct intonation the correct tune uh, so her tuning is fantastic her tuning i mean uncle thum uh, is considered like the benchmark in correct correct intonation so really you can't you can't touch her there's never been a recording where she there's been recordings where she made mistakes by forgetting lyrics or by even her rhythm rhythmically she started on the wrong measure or the wrong note in a measure so she's she slipped a few times there's definitely i've heard some bootlegs where she's done that uh, where she mixed her lyrics but there's never been a recording where her intonation was off uh you know and that was an incredible quality and in arabic music i would say like this is this along with the you know having a beautiful voice uh and then the next point i'm going to talk about is how she ornaments the melody right so um Again, this is kind of related to the conversation I had uh, in the previous uh, lecture. Um, you know, the composition has some uh, skeleton, uh, skeletal melody, which is a simple melody. And then the singer or the instrumentalist or everybody together, there's a heterophony, you know, everybody together will ornament these and embellish them according to their instrument. And uh, she's doing it according to her instrument, which is the voice. Uh, and so, you know, you. A note is never just like a note, uh, you know, uh, a note is basically a note plus all the the beautiful effects around it, right? So, um, you know, here, let's hear again what she's what she's doing. So you hear what what she did here, Yum. Uh, this this uh, vibrato that she does, uh, she controls it so precisely to what she wants to do, right? There's always bits of vibrato. There's other grace notes. Uh, vocal ornamentation is a very large subject, and um, it's also a, a a matter of fashion. You know, it changes with the time period. Like so, what she's doing here, this song was from 1936, right? It's very different to what she does in 1976 because the aesthetics uh, changed, kind of like the you know the fashion changed, uh, lots of things changed. But uh, so I'm gonna stop this um, uh, this uh, track. I'm gonna take you a little bit forward to the future to like w a different track. So what what happened during Uncle Tum's age is uh, Arabic music was growing and kind of. Uh, finding its way in the 20th century and evolving. And uh, one of the things that was changing was the size of this orchestra. This is a very small orchestra called the Tacht, uh, which means like a chamber group. Uh, the chamber group has usually maybe four, um, four instrumentalists and one, uh, uh, four melodic instrumentalists and one percussion instrument. So like it's a very small, tight ensemble. Uh, you know, fast forward to like, uh, 1966 so that's 30 years later and i'm gonna show you the orchestra um here's here's the orchestra <laughs> it's, it's a very very big difference uh okay this is the president attending the concert whatever uh and then this is the orchestra okay So the, ins the instrument you're hearing now to who's doing solos is the kanun. 
uh, and that Karun player was with her for like 30 years, you know, throughout her, her career. The Oud player who's here sitting, so she has the Kanun on one end and the, uh, the Oud on one end. Why? You know, these are like her two melodic bodyguards or her two intonational references, right? Very, very important because they give her the right intonation and also they, you know, they give her the melody. So she follows them like, you know, riding on, on a ladder just to make sure that she's in tempo. She's following the correct melody. So she surrounds herself with specifically it's never anything other than those two instruments immediately sitting around her. Right. And these two instruments were in the original chamber group. But now, of course, the ensemble has grown quite, quite a lot because uh, the times have changed in Egypt and they wanted to modernize by modernize. That meant uh, imitate, uh, you know, uh, more European, uh, you know, classical ensembles by bringing in, you know, two dozen violins, for example. So, so let's look at the, uh, the arrangement here. We have two cellos. We have one upright bass and then two or three percussionists. One of them is the rick, which is always present. Uh, even if there's other percussionists, you cannot take that guy out because he is like the rhythm, the manager or the, the rhythm uh, you know, coordinator or manager. You know, there's many words, but he's the guy who keeps the rhythm together. Very, very important. And then here you have violins. And then because, you know, this is the uh, the 60s in Egypt, they wanted to also modernize by bringing European instruments. And lo and behold, accordion. What's the accordion doing in Egypt? Well, the accordion became part and parcel of Egyptian music, uh, you know, in the 20th century. And they uh, modified it me mechanically. They changed the reeds in order to uh, detune certain notes so that it can play uh, quarter tones, you know, the average value of a quarter tone because quarter tones change. You can change them on a fretless instrument, but not on the accordion. So they picked a, you know, a good, a good point for each quarter tone. And uh, they do it by uh, the direction of the blowing, you know, if you depending on who there's no standard. Right. But in some accordions, when you pull out, you're uh, doing the quarter tone reads. And when you pull back in, push back in, you're doing the regular semitone reads. Uh, and so the accordion now is able to do the Arabic scales. And this is an accordion. Uh, in some other videos, you'll see also an electric guitar and then you might see a saxophone. This is the electric guitar. <laughs> the camera person is looking, where is that guitar? And there he is. I, I wrote a lot uh, in, in my book about the electric guitar because I'm fascinated by the fact that this guy uh, he's so uh, opposite to the image of the uh, electric guitarist playing a Fender Stratocaster in, let's say, in England or the United States at the time. This is 1966, right? So people were like, you know, Led Zeppelin was making their guitar scream, uh, you know, etc. And they were rebellious and they had long hair. Uh, and this guy is like, he has a very clean cut. He's wearing a, a jacket and a suit and he's not even standing. He's got the guitar on his on his thigh and he's playing it very politely uh, because, you know, the instrument, uh, when it changes hands and it changes cultures, it becomes a different instrument. The accordionist also, this is not a European accordion. It's an Arabic accordion. So it becomes its own thing in, in, in a different culture. So what I wanted to say is, uh, so you look at this ensemble. Wow, this is like so much larger than the the tiny ensemble in the in this video. I mean, we don't have video here, but I described it as five instruments. The other thing uh, we, we see also is this introduction. It could run 10 minutes. The introduction in 1936, it ran half a half a minute. Here, let's hear it again. Okay. 
okay, I was wrong. It's 13 seconds. It's a quarter minute. So that's introduction. This is the other introduction. I mean, from the moment they started playing, it, it could run 10, 15 minutes. So what's happening? Well, the fashion changed. Uh, composers wanted a piece of the pie. If the song was going to run, because now they didn't have to fit everything on a on their record, right? And they didn't have the constraint of six minutes. Um, you know, they could play as long as they wanted in a live setting. So now they basically stretch everything. They stretch the introduction and they stretch the song. And now they, they have more elaborate songs which have different sections and different maqams. So that's what happened because of the, the format, uh, you know, uh, recording format or the uh, broadcasting format changed. They were able to do that. Um, composers now were very excited because in the first 10 minutes, you're also listening to their music without a singer. So they're getting a little bit of their fame. Um, the, so so, so what, what's so amazing about all this is Um Kultum, you know, she's like a, she's like a chameleon or, a, or someone who's very adaptable, right? Because, you know, she could have stopped singing, singing in 1940s and said, okay, you know what, this new, new music, these big orchestras, they're not for me, you know, I'm kind of old fashioned, I like small orchestras and she could have retired or something or became like a museum piece, but she didn't. And she kept riding, riding that wave every time there was a substantial change in format or new forms came or new instruments or new recording media or anything. She was on top of it. She was like a leader. She was on it. She was, she kept following. So she kept changing composers. So in 1960s and 70s, she had a different set of composers than the ones she had in 1930s, for sure. Um, for example, the Zakaria Ahmed and Muhammad al qasabji are two of her very big composers in the 30s and 40s. And they did some amazing stuff that kind of lives, lives on forever. But she kind of dropped them in the 50s and 60s. She... She switched to Riyad al sumbati and then uh, Balik Hamdi, who's like a bit later, and Muhammad Abdul Wahab, who's also in the 70s and late 60s. So why? Because these guys were able to arrange songs for big orchestras like this. And she wanted, you know, she didn't want to be forgotten. She wanted to be in the in the in crowd at the forefront and do big orchestras and big concerts and travel the world. And she did. So listen a little bit more to this to when she starts singing. So what's going to happen here? <coughs> this is in Maqam Bayati, by the way. The uh, the song is called Baid Annak, Far Away From You, and it's composed by Balik Hamdi. I'm going to ask you to notice how the guitar, who's not fitted with the uh, frets for quarter tones, is playing the upper part of the phrase. What comes next has a quarter tone and then the band does it. He doesn't do it. That line. Now, okay, so that's how they decided to do it. They could have added more frets, but I don't think they had the the technology or like, you know, they didn't want to go through the trouble of adding more frets to an electric guitar. They had a, you know, standard vanilla, you know, Fender Stratocaster and they, they just used it as is. So he would skip some lines, but the accordion could do it. And the violins, of course, are fretless, so they could do anything they wanted, right? <coughs> The camera shifted its uh, focus to the middle because she's about to stand up. So what happens here is they they all know when the introduction is about to finish. The introduction is a big deal because there's this suspense, this like uh, building up this uh, this momentum, you know, uh, for when the lady is going to stand up and start singing. So everything is building to this moment where she stands and says the first word. <laughs> This is the 
a big moment. <laughs> this is the Elvis Presley moment, or what's a good comparison in uh, in in American pop music? I can't think of a good p comparison that is as as big and huge and gigantic as Um Kulthum. Notice the difference in her, the depth of her voice uh, at this age, in 1936, 1960, this 30 years later, her voice is so much deeper, much more alto. I, I love her voice like this. Uh, the only drawback is she could hit very high notes in the 30s, which she cannot do in the 60s. To me, like that, that's okay. I, I, I much prefer this voice, this deeper voice full of kind of uh, drama and uh, <clears throat> I, to me, it, it kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, it, I, I find it, I enjoy it a lot more than the young voice. Okay, what happened here, uh, the, the ensemble, the orchestra, actually does not know how many times she's going to repeat this line. And this line, or those two lines, <clears throat> you know, uh, so in Arabic music, again, this is one very important uh, theme to understand, is there's a, there's a raw composition, which is a skeleton, and then the singer uh, can take it further and uh, higher and can do whatever she wants with it. Uh, and this orchestra has to be ready for anything, basically. Um, uh, if you notice one thing about the orchestra, they're not reading from sheet music. Uh, because, <laughs> you know, it's impossible to do the job they, they need to do by reading from sheet music. They would crash and burn, like, after one minute. Because, you know, Uncle Tum wants to repeat this thing um, three repetitions, four repetitions. We don't know how many times, until her voice is warm until she feels in the moment, until she feels like she's uh, given it enough, you know, with every repetition, she does slightly different ornamentations. Uh, sometimes she does changes like the melody a little bit. Sometimes she, she's she been known to change the words a few times just to kind of try something different, you know. All of that is acceptable. It's not like she's not breaking any rules. All of this is acceptable. The, 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 the point of the concert is not to be faithful to the composition or the composer. Uh, the point of the concert is tarab and you can never basically achieve tarab if you're really too concerned or kind of blinded by the composition it it's the opposite of tarab so what happens in a you know like a similar size orchestra in in, in western classical music that is opposite to tarab tarab is basically she's giving us something instant instantaneous from the moment from from her to us directly so <clears throat> A much better metaphor of um, uh, of tarab, or the, the the same kind of paradigm is jazz. Uh, you know, when the improviser gets on stage and they start improvising, this is tarab, because you're getting something fresh from the improviser directly. Uh, there is a composition exactly the same way in jazz. There's a raw composition. There's a skeleton, uh, and everybody knows it. But you know, you take that further and you do your own thing with it every time, and preferably you do it differently. Otherwise, it gets boring. So this is like, this is jazz. This is what she's doing. So here the, the ensemble was ready either for a repetition or for the next line. Either way, they had to be ready. And they know they know the two options, but sometimes they need to hear the first note to know like what to play with her. Otherwise, the band, you'll hear the band, the ensemble, uh, I mean the orchestra, 
um, you know, hesitating a little bit because which 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 way is she gonna go? She's gonna repeat or she's gonna she's gonna go to the next line. They really have to hear her. There's no conductor. Again, so this is like I'm showing you the major difference with Arabic music. Okay, there's no sheet music, no conductor. Where is the composition? It's in their minds, in memory. They study the composition for, they practice it for a good month. They start with sheet music and the rehearsals, or sometimes they don't. Like Uncle Thum, the composer used to come to her house and basically teach her the composition line by line on a oud, because all of her composers played the oud inevitably. And she would learn it by heart, and that's it. Again, repetitions and repetitions and repetitions. I, I remember when I was um, when I was a kid, like in my I don't know in my teens or or earlier, I used to like detest Uncle Tom. You know what is up with this old lady who's whining and whining and repeating and repeating and how many times can you hear the same line? Uh, you know, and that's kind of like a normal reaction for that kind of period and also. Uh, you know, she sounded too Arabic to me. It was kind of old fashioned. It's like what my parents used to listen to or even my grandparents. And really, like I couldn't stand listening to her um, until a little bit later, like in my in my college years. So I started feeling like, oh, wow, there's a lot of stuff there. You know, she's very interesting. Um, so even though she was old fashioned, but, you know, you have to remember, like I went to college uh, in the 80s. In the 80s, she was almost still contemporary. Okay, she she had died, but she was like, she was contemporary from 10 years before that. She, was, she wasn't like, some of those songs in the 70s were 10 years old, so they weren't really that old. And so I could relate to them finally uh, in my teen, in my, in my college years. <laughs> mistake she skipped she forgot or she she forgot the next line and that's it the orchestra keeps playing not a big deal nothing to see here you know and then she'll she'll join at the next repetition <laughs> she again she's got she's got the 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 rhythm wrong i think it's because the president was watching her and um it's okay because these mistakes really are not like fundamental mistakes. Uh, if she sang out of tune, that would be like a really, really horrible, very embarrassing thing. Picked up, she picked up again. <laughs> I never heard this version before. Uh, she's making lots of this. I think she's really, really, really nervous. Every, everything is forgiven. The, 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 the audience is very, very happy, right? Notice. Nobody cared about the mistakes because that's not really, it's kind of, 
irrelevant. Re what's relevant is her voice, her presence, her emotion, uh, the tarab, you know, that's really what they came to hear. And, you know, they're totally happy. Everybody's like really, really happy. It's amazing. Like if this happened, let's compare it with like an orchestra in a, you know, like in Vienna or in, uh, you know, in Germany doing a, a, a piano concert or a, an opera or something. And they have that many mistakes because <laughs> probably the the singer would go and commit suicide at the end of it but you know it's a different culture with different different uh, standards of formality we talk about this in our book a lot um sammy was really obsessed with this concept of we are informal in this but we're very formal in other ways like in intonation wow if nobody would dare sing out of tune because then they would be like really pelted with you know rotten tomatoes and um Okay, uh, should I should I take a pause for uh, questions or should I keep playing different tracks from like different periods or different different genres or what do you guys want to do? You're probably sick of hearing me talk. Good. Do you guys have any questions for John? Any observations about this particular the idea? Of, did, did anybody else catch these mistakes? <laughs> yeah. There's an, an incredible subtlety that goes into being a listener. And the thing about it is we all have that. It's just the music we listen to is what we are most familiar with. So the, of course, of course. You need to know the music. I know this song really, really well. And that's why I, I could catch all the mistakes. Uh, maybe right. this was like one of the first times she performed it and people weren't aware of the melody. So they basically just went with it. So what's your question? Yeah, so your question is, would the audience have recognized these things? Uh, maybe some yes, maybe some no. Uh, but really, like what I'm, I wasn't really meaning to demonstrate mistakes here with this video. I was trying to demonstrate Tarab, so the mistakes just showed up. I hadn't prepared this track, you know, for this reason. So they're not very important. Um, so what I wanted to show you is, um, you know, the the other thing that she's really famous for, Uncle Thum, is um, doing some some improvisations on the composed melody, and in Arabic they're called tafarid, which is the plural of tafarid. Tafarid, the only, it only means like literally a solo performance or a solo in, uh, a solo, yeah, like singing solo, basically singing alone. Uh, but tafarid really means that she can take a melody and then uh, ad lib on that melody. But you know, it's not easy to do that because. Um, it's like jazz. It's like jazz. Basically, you can take a melody, say, you know, like uh, you're you're playing a piece around midnight and you need to like, uh, you know, let's say John Coltrane takes the raw melody and then uh, repeats it four times, does a solo with very different versions of that melody, right? Uh, she doesn't go as far as John Coltrane, but she does lots of improvisations that are very, very... Uh, interesting and 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 they get more and more enjoyable and interesting if you actually know the song well and then suddenly of course you enjoy it more right because you see that song that you know and suddenly she's taking it and doing different things with it which is amazing because like one of the one of the fundamental uh, you know qualities of arabic music is improvisation just like ornamentation you know all of these are the interaction between the different members and between them and the audience, this heterophony, all of these are features of Arabic music that, uh, you know, uh, maybe are not present in like the... I keep comparing to classical music because they're copying the classical uh, music orchestra. So I, I think the comparison is valid there, even though like as a paradigm, it should be compared with a jazz, with a jazz ensemble. Uh, let's listen to this and see what she does with one line and repeats it, you know, 50 times. This is a song from 1961. So this was the beginning of her filmed, uh, you know, videos. Uh, it's a song by um, Bariyad Sumbati, composed by Bariyad Sumbati, called Ansak. Oh, sorry, oh, by Bali Hamdi. I'm sorry. Um, so um, I don't want to focus on one composer, but I accidentally did that. I was, we'll, we'll play other composers. Anyway, she's uh, ad-libbing on one line. <coughs> Oh, 
Okay, maybe this track is not a good example because she's not improvising yet. Okay, let's let's try to find the different uh, different track. Oh, I know why I didn't. Uh, this this doesn't have video, but it has a really good audio. So I. I... From 1943, this song called composed by Zakaria Ahmed. And let's see how many times she repeats that line and does something different with it. Okay, she went to the next line. Let's see if she's gonna repeat again or we're done. Okay, so she's taking that line and I Zaraf means I wanna know why you're mad at me. Uh, full of drama and emotion and like and, and pain from being in love and she's like taking it further, right? Now, what's what's the orchestra doing here? This is fascinating. I would like, I would I would pay anything to just be a member of that orchestra because the most the most enjoyable time is when the orchestra is actually following an improviser, not when they're playing a composition. I mean that's enjoyable too. But when you're when when she's like leading them leading them somewhere, it's fascinating because they're all like, um, you know, they're all thinking so hard and 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 trying to like follow and then also improvising behind her, right? So. What, what's she doing here? She changed the maqam of that line or the, the, the jins, the small melody to maqam rust, which is much more kind of um, happy than the previous version. Uh, <clears throat> I'll try to sing both of them for you. So the previous one was uh, This is Hijaz Kar, uh, which is very dramatic but kind of dark. Uh, now she's doing which is in rust uh, very different color immediately she changed the color of the entire thing using the same lyrics she never came up with like I mean rarely but it's the same lyrics but kind of she can change the melody so so what does the orchestra do suddenly the singer is like <laughs> singing the one line in a different maqam what are they to do well they do what they do which is this is this is what they do is they follow and they improvise with her and this is like an amazing uh, communally creative moment where everybody's creating instead of everybody's reading from sheet music it's so much more advanced than like an orchestra reading with a conductor reading from sheet music 
in terms of what they're able to do. Did you hear what the Kanun did? He did the, 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 the scale. This is all coming from his mind, right? From his from his improvisation. Uh, basically, all of these musicians, okay, maybe not all of them, but the front row, like the the the, the inner circle, uh, they're all experts in their field. And so you give them a, a, a motif, a subject, a topic, and they will improvise on it for 10 minutes. So that's what they're doing together. Ah, oh, okay. So here, here you hear the audience. The audience is going crazy because she's giving them something from her in the moment. It's instantaneous. It's improvised, and and it's just for this, for this audience in this concert. In the next concert, it's gonna be a different improvisation made for the other audience. So they're getting something uniquely tailored for them, and there's so much joy in that in the audience. Now she's gonna go. I know where she's going from the from the from the way she's kind of getting there. She's going to uh, something. Okay, I'm gonna gamble my opinion. She's going to Makam Suznak. She's gonna do a Jins Hijaz on the fifth degree. So like as as, a, as an experienced musician and or not necessarily a theorist, but someone who's heard all of these variations before, like the the audience. They're not music theorists. They probably have no clue what the maqam is called, but they know the melodies really, really well orally. And so they're very excited. Oh, is she going to go to that branch or to the other branch? And there's this anticipation. <laughs> so she... This is uh, um, Makam Suznak, which has like a jins rust on the bottom. Too much theory, but anyway, it's a very familiar melody that's really beautiful, very different to, you know, <coughs> and it's nice to see it uh, appear suddenly now in the in the sequence. She goes back to the original melody. She brought us back on track, back to the original melody. And now she's uh, basically going to continue the song. Uh, there was like a 10 minute parenthesis, a di digression where she did her tafarid. Uh, people, I think probably this is the highest point in the concert for sure. Like if I was in that concert, those 10 minutes would be the highest point because she's singing something exclusive and, and uh, you know, and improvised. <laughs> And so on and so on and the song uh, you know finishes uh i i want to play you um just so you can you can see the influence in kultum has on the younger singers i'm going to play you a cover um <clears throat> by uh a, a new singer um
All right. This is a young Palestinian singer called Dalal Abu Amini. Young, I mean, in comparison to Um Kulthum. And this is like, this stuff is contemporary on the last five years or this song. And and everybody, I mean, you know, her shadow is so, is so big that it's impossible to escape her shadow. So someone who wants to do the traditional repertoire will will aspire to sing almost as good as Um Kulthum, but nobody ever achieves that level. And that's it. She's kind of a phenomenon that's gone. But here's, you know, one one possible cover of this. <laughs> Now everybody uh, left the composed melody. It's understood that she wants to do something here. So now they're just giving her this motif, tam ta ram ta ram ta ra 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 ram, and every, uh, the musicians are ready now. They're ready for an improvisation. <laughs> the uh, violinist or cellist, I can't see the ensemble really well, was almost like a, almost instantaneously played that note with her. Da, he droned because he knew where she was going. Um, so what's happening here? Like there's there's so much expertise and, and oral learning that goes into play when you reach this moment that kind of informs people what to do in this moment, right? There's something you have to learn by doing, by listening a lot and knowing the repertoire really well, knowing the maqam, the, the maqam sayer, you know, the, the course of the maqamat really, really well. Otherwise, you'll be lost here. You'll be blind. You won't know where, where she's going. And you have to have a lot of experience actually following someone who's improvising or improvising yourself. So all of these musicians are very, very skilled at that. So this is not a group of people who just came out of a music academy and they read really well <laughs> because that skill is like you know, totally useless in this case, right? So they need to be uh, listeners, they need to adapt, they need to follow, they need to improvise, they need to all contribute to this. Everything they're doing here is not composed or notated, right? This is a moment where they stretch time and introduce an improvisation called a tafrid. And so... <laughs> I, I want to say something about the listeners because this whole, they're a very important part of the equation. This whole thing wouldn't happen without listeners who are going, ah, you know, and, and voicing their approval and they're, you know, supporting the singers back and the singers give them more and the, and the listeners give the singer back, you know, the, their approval. And it's a, it's a feedback loop where everybody's happy, right? And, and you, you couldn't do this in a studio. You could maybe try to do it, but it'll never be... Uh, you know, equally good in a studio setting where uh, nobody's kind of listening to you and, and feeding you back uh, positive feedback. So the listener is very important. What makes this, uh, this uh, kind of exercise here really successful? To me, like this is my favorite setting to do improvisation because the orchestra is small, the room is small, and the audience is small. I mean, okay, Uncle Thum did it in a gigantic proportion, but to me, like as a, as a, Musician, I like the chamber setting very, very much. I think it's the most conducive because you see people really closely, you hear them well, the ensemble is small, so you don't have to worry about, you know, uh, 50 people kind of following. Uh, even though the Inkultum Orchestra does a fantastic job, you don't really feel the weight or the inertia of the orchestra. You feel like the whole orchestra can turn on a dime, really, because they're very, very well trained in this kind of paradigm of, you know, uh, but a smaller uh, group would be like so much more agile and nimble and and then everybody will have room for their own like you can hear the kanun here right so the kanun is one out of four instruments the kanun has room to play the oud can do something will it'll be heard right 
Um, if they had an eye, then I would do something. Everybody has their voice heard because there's not too many of them. So that's the perfect setting. I would be the Rick player, of course, in the corner, feeling elated from this whole tarab. Uh, very, very excited. Uh, I'll be this guy here. Okay, what she did with her hand, and even if she didn't do that with her hand, uh, I, I knew what she was going to do. She's going to double the tempo. Instead of going, tum, ta, 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 she's going to go, tum, she's going to do the maksum tempo. The whole ensemble, you know, on a dime, they're ready. They know exactly where she's going from experience. <laughs> She's back. So, so this this is all like Uncle Tum tradition, right? Uh, and I mean, Uncle Tum didn't invent it, but she made the tradition so so uh, so big and you know uh, popular that singers today are following in her footsteps. Uh, with the understanding that she is the, you know, she's a one in a lifetime uh, phenomenon who's never gonna, you know, she's never gonna be uh, imitated. Uh, nobody's gonna actually get to her. Um, like her most, uh, the closest person to Um Kulthum today is uh, an Egyptian also singer um, <clears throat> called May Faru, and she uh, does lots and lots of concerts around the world. Uh, let me share my screen again. I'll show you a video of my Faru and then I'll take questions just to kind of um, show you where, where the Im Kulthum tradition is these days. Uh, so my Faru, she came to the U.S. a few times. She played with the National Arabic Orchestra. Okay, so I mean, here's one example of my Faru. Uh, Okay, that was my Farouk. What she was doing, she was taking one vowel and changing the you know melody on one vowel. It's called a, a melisma. Uh, and uh, Arabic music is full of melismas or melismata. Uh, and I'm gonna end with my Farouk. Okay, so um, any questions? Are you are you getting are you getting what I'm what I'm what I'm getting at here? In that last video with my phone, there's a conductor. Yes. Okay. Yes. There's a conductor, Michael Ibrahim. Uh, yes. Um, it's a hybrid orchestra. He's going for the conductor model. I disagree with with that, and you know, I'm I'm good friends with him, but he he's a very um, you know um, kind of uh, he insists on conducting the orchestra. He doesn't just want to train them and leave them alone. He was Western uh, trained. He plays the the bassoon. He has a master's in music performance. So his his kind of uh, background is Western. And uh, some of the members of that orchestra or also um, are not very steeped in Arabic music. They have a Western background. And so uh, the orchestra is a little bit of a hybrid. It lends itself a little bit to being uh, run by a conductor. And um, kind of, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the world of... Uh, trying to compete for grants in the in the United States, you look more credible as an orchestra if you have a conductor. Uh, so for, you know, practical, uh, pragmatic purposes, even only, uh, 
it makes sense to have a conductor. I would not want to play with a conductor as a as a percussionist. It would be like it would kill me. And I I know a lot of uh, my percussionist friends who are much much better percussionists who actually had the chance to play with the National Arabic Orchestra came back with horror stories about what it feels like to be conducted as a percussionist because we really we we are the conductors in in the paradigm in the Arabic music paradigm. So. Uh, yes, very good question. Uh, yes, I've never played with them. I would not want to play with them. I mean, they, I've never been invited, but you know, there's so many better percussionists. But I would, I don't think it would be an enjoyable experience. Like my ideal experience would be that chamber group that we saw before, my Faru. That would be perfect uh, for Tarab. Uh, okay, next question. Any other questions? Don, can I ask you a question? Please. Um, tea house culture in the Middle East. How significant is like the tea house to the development of music performance? Tea house? Uh, you mean like the cafes? Yeah. yeah. I think the cafes had a very important role to play before recording, right? I think the in the 1920s and 30s. I mean, there's a lot of uh, CDs, like uh, archival CDs that actually um, have stuff that was performed in in cafes because that was like the prime uh, uh, medium for performing uh, Arabic music and uh, listening to Arabic music. Once recording came, you know, once you had once you were selling records, uh, tea houses were not really a factor. And then you had radio. Radio was a huge factor. The phonograph was a huge factor. And then movies, not so much for Uncle Tsum's career, but for other uh, me mega stars, uh, movies were very very important. Like for uh, Abdel Halim Hafiz, for example, he did uh, lots and lots of movies. Muhammad Abdul Wahab did lots of movies. Farid Al Atrash was in many, many movies, and then they incorporated, you know, Oriental dance, also also known as belly dance. Uh, so movies were important. Uh, tea houses were kind of done by the 30s. Yes. But again, I'm not a historian, so like that's not my my strong point. But I I don't hear anyone discuss tea houses. But the um, the fact that um, the Palestinian singer sets up her performance as if it's a cafe no no she's not she's setting up as if someone's living room it's a salon basically yeah. so but uh, it's, it's um an intentional reference to older culture uh, I mean salons are are older than tea houses and they've always been uh, around and uh, you know if you look at uh, the Aleppo tradition, uh, playing in someone's living room is like one of the foremost avenues for hearing music and playing music. And even like you have CDs that, uh, let me show you one CD cover. Uh, uh, okay, this is a CD cover by Al Kindi and it's called the, the Aleppian Music Room and it shows a beautiful, magnificent living room with a water fountain and lots of uh, sofas and canopies around it with all the instruments there. This is what Dalal Abu Amni was trying to emulate, uh, you know, playing in, in, a, in a warm uh, indoor environment where the sound carries really well and people are there for the music. You know, this is kind of we're also there's there's people in New York who are trying to get that to happen. But it's been very, very difficult to find space and to find musicians and to kind of make the equation work financially. But to me, like that would be my favorite format. Yeah, I suppose in New York, living rooms are small. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're out of time, guys. Please help me thank Johnny Farage. Thank you. I hope you you came out with some appreciation of the the greatness of and the grandeur of M. Kultum. If you did, then I did a good job. All right. Thank you so much, Johnny. Thank you. Bye. John. All right, so for Wednesday, we're looking at sort of where popular music in Egypt has gone sort of post-1975. We'll look at some of the stuff on Maraginat and um, contemporary Egyptian sort of hip-hop and how that borrows from or sort of transforms some of the elements of this tradition. All right, I'll see you guys on Wednesday. All right. Have a good trip back. Yeah. Um, and if you have any questions, you know, feel free to email me. Let me know. Henry, Thank you. All right, man. I'll see you, bro. Yeah. yeah. I'll see you next week. Then. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.